It is hard for me to believe that it's been two years plus since I first and last talked with our featured guest today, Ted Lowe. He's a prolific author and just one of those those great thinkers. I enjoyed so much our visit, Ted, from a couple years ago. I'm glad we can connect again. And these connections seem to take place in concert with the release of some of your newest work. This book is called Us in Mind, How Changing Your Thoughts Can Change Your Marriage. Uh, and I actually think that could probably apply to change your life in general, right? So first of all, how are you, man? How's life been for the last two years? We met during a pandemic. Was it during the t pandemic? Wow. It's yeah, it's, it's been a little bit of a ride, hadn't it for the last couple of years. I'll so say, yeah. yeah. So yes, uh, we have, we have four kids and uh, just managing all that, but life has been good. It's been full of excitements. And as I was setting all this up, uh, this morning, getting ready for this interview, my wife walks in and she goes, you have a very strange job. And I went, yes. <laughs> I hear that a lot too. <laughs> yes, I do. So uh, yeah, but all is well. Thanks for asking. You know, I was thinking that during the, those couple of years when things were slowed down from a travel standpoint and all that, that perhaps it gave you more time to write. Did us in mind come out of that slowdown period? Absolutely. And I didn't mean for it to, because I've only written two other books and it was, I kind of wanted it to be done because it's really hard for me. I'd say I had ADHD long before it was cool to have it. And uh, writing a book is like lassoing squirrels and training them not to fidget. So that, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I was mainly wanted to dive in. I thought I've got a little extra time. And there's some questions that I had after working with married couples for two plus decades. And I thought, there's a couple of things I really don't understand that I would really love to get some answers to. Um, and those questions were, why is it that some couples will hear a message or read a book or hear an interview on your podcast and go, huh, that makes sense. I think I'll apply that. They'll apply it and it makes a difference. While someone else can hear the same information, read the same information and, you know, push it away. And then I started asking, what makes a great marriage great? Like if we really focused on what are couples that are really doing great, what are they doing that's different uh, than the majority? Uh, and the answers I found, I thought, oh, wow, I don't think most people know how simple this is. I don't think anyone's told us this to the point where I think, oh, I really want to share this. And then I had the impression that I need to write a book. And I honestly, Bill was like, oh, no, I know what the process is like. And it's not easy, uh, but it did give me time during the pandemic that I would have never had. And I never would have paused to go ask these questions. So um, God's used it in a, um, in a way in our lives. So for that, I'm thankful. I so much admire those couples. Usually they've been married for 40, 50 plus years who seem to have figured out all of these things. And you talk about a change of your thoughts and how it impacts your marriage. One of my favorite things to learn from those accomplished and successful couples is when did that change take place? Because it certainly didn't happen in the first couple of years or the first, maybe even couple decades. So mm. uh, we'll get into defining what changing your thoughts looks like, but I'd love to hear from you if, if you've done all this research, when is it that you, you see established couples get that concept? You know, actually for some couples, they do start off well, it's not every couple that that starts up uh, challenging, challenging, and then finds their way. Um, that what they're what I found in the research was that the only there was a common denominator with couples, and it wasn't um, social economic, it wasn't finances, it wasn't family of origin. Um, and it turns out what I found was that your thoughts matter most when it comes to your marriage, that your thoughts matter most. And I thought that's the thing that most of us are not thinking about as our thoughts, that we have all these automatic thoughts and we live as if they're telling us the truth all the time and that, as if they're always guiding us in the right direction. So, um, but I think once people, I think some couples, you know, whether it was modeled well, they think in a good way, whether it's their faith, they think in a good way, but the great news, I think all of us can learn how to think better. So what do we need to change? What 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 sort of thinking are you addressing in the book? Well, one of the studies that stuck out the most was there was a group of 
psychologist that went, what if a great marriage is not the opposite of one that's struggling? What if it's different? What if it's like everything else? You know, a great business is not the opposite of one that is struggling. It's different. A great football coach is not the opposite of one that's struggling. There's a difference. And so they did a massive study in the United States and the United Kingdom. And they came back and they said, huh, it turns out our hunch is correct. Couples that report the highest level of marital satisfaction, their marriage, it's not the opposite of one that's struggling. It's different. And so one of the examples that they use is couples in the study were asked to give their spouse what was basically a spousal report card to rank themselves, to rank their spouse some character characteristics like generosity and kindness and loyalty, uh, sense of humor. And what they found was the happiest couples were the ones who ranked their spouse higher in every single category than their spouse had ranked themselves. In other words, a happy couple is made up of two people that look at each other thinking, oh, I just wish you could see you the way I see you. Hmm. And so that's what, and then from a neurological perspective, when you start looking at the neuroscience and what they would find is that couples that are happy just think in a way, there's a part of the brain that's responsible for positive illusion that couples with high levels of marital satisfaction had in common. And positive illusion is the ability to focus on what you do like about your spouse and not focus on what you don't. Which here's what I know if people are probably listening thinking, well, that's great news for the people that think like this, right? <laughs> yeah. That's just scientific evidence of why we're crushing it. Well, what about the rest of us? And that's where I get really excited to say, hey, we can really start to change the way the way we think. Is, so it, I, is it a relatively new approach for researchers to study couples that would be considered happy or successful? Or did we did research always focus instead on what went wrong instead of what's going right? Until about 10 or 15 years ago, all the research was wow. basically focused in on couples that were struggling. And they would take what they would learn and they would come back and basically say, don't do this, do the opposite of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, because it was always the thing of couples that were struggling say, we don't understand each other. So the opposite of that would be, oh, you have a full, clear understanding of your strengths and weaknesses. So you know what you're dealing with. So we're going to communicate. So we understand the reality of what's going on. And what they found out was this whole idea of love blindness is it's true. Like there's some rose colored glasses to this that makes some people uncomfortable, but it is a, it is a different way of viewing your spouse that happy couples just get. Well, and, and I, um, I, I think of this in terms of our struggle as a culture with narcissism, right? You just, you just talked about how the happier couples are the ones who are thinking highly of or complimenting or, putting in a positive light how their spouse is handling certain things, perhaps even better than they are. That's a rare maturity, I think, because right now we have a culture that spends a lot more time looking into a mirror than through a window. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we do everything that just reflects, how does this reflect on me? It's, it would, it's awfully hard for me as a husband to uh, want to put myself lower on the leaderboard than, than my wife, right? That's more truth than I'm comfortable with. So thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> and we wrap things up with that. <laughs> but that's very true. That is that is a point no one's made yet in, in the interviews. And I think that's a very good point to make, that that's one of the challenges that makes that difficult for sure. So when we talk about changing thoughts, um, where do we start? How, how can you take a couple who right now is listening to this interview or watching it and thinking, well, I, I get the concept, I, I change my thoughts into what? Do I need to become more like my mom? Do I need to overhaul everything? Uh, <laughs> where do I start with this? And, and it's, I know everybody's got their own unique story, but is there a kind of a practical overlay that you can help provide where they can, they can check some things off the list? Absolutely. I mean, the National Science Foundation says that we have somewhere between 16,000 to 64,000 thoughts a day. So that's a lot of thoughts. And then they went on to say that 80% of them are negative and 90% of them are repetitive. So our brains are kind of wired in a way to look for pattern. Our brains in a, are wired in a way to protect ourselves, which, you know, is good on some sense, but in some ways it's, it's a challenge. So what I want to say to, to couples 
uh, when it's when I started looking at the research is it, when got what's called guiding thoughts are applied to other areas of life, like exercise or career or, you know, football coaches and basketball coaches, coaches in general, get this idea that if I can get someone's mindset in the right direction, it's really going to help them. Um, you know, we, we tell people all the time, you got to get out of your head. So what I would do in the book is I give couples just five really quick thoughts. I mean, two to three word thoughts to help them to gear their brain, to think in a way that's going to gear them to love in the way they want to, because I don't believe people have bad hearts. I just think they have bad habits. And I don't think anyone's ever told us how to be married. So what these really simple thoughts do is give us a pause to think and to gear it and say, okay, how do I respond in a way that on my best moments that I want to respond? Because I think people in their best moments, as they're listening right now and say, do you want to be a good spouse? Most of us go, yeah. I mean, even if you're frustrated, you go, Hey, I'm, I'm really frustrated with my spouse, but I still want to be a good one myself. I still want to do everything that I can do. And so I just give them five really qu quick thoughts that help guide their um, thoughts to posture them to love, to love better. And, and that's been really fun watching the simplicity of that. Cause when I first started this, I thought, wow, the challenge of this is going to be is making this simple. And I, cause I thought most people are not going to be geeking out by neuroscience, relational neuroscience, like I was. So I thought, but they do geek out about wanting to, to, to love better and to have a better marriage. Yeah. Um, and what was in the middle of this whole thing, when I started seeing all the secular research that I had this moment when I was like, have I entered into some kind of new age land of, Hey, this can't be this simple or new age land of what does scripture have to say about this? And then I was excited yet frustrated almost with myself to go, how have I missed it? Because scripture is so clear about not letting our brains just run on autopilot. So clear to take captive of every thought to test and approve what God's good, pleasing and perfect will is. I mean, how few times do we stop test and approve and go, is, is this thought good? <laughs> you know, is this a good thought for my marriage? You know what I'm thinking about them. Um, and so I just, again, I give five thoughts. And so I'll, I'll give you one example. I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example that started off at bad, but it's changed. I'm going to give you a little failure here of my own, my own life. My wife and I had just moved back. Uh, we lived in Southern California for their first five years of marriage, and I highly recommend it. It was fantastic. We loved it. We had great friends. We loved our job. I was going to school. And then we moved back to the Atlanta area, and we, we were two hours away from our folks, so we weren't around, any, and we just didn't know anybody. And I was just really struggling and I didn't know that I was struggling really. I just was, I think I didn't, I was underestimating how big a shift that this was going to be for me from a relational standpoint and a career standpoint. So I was just struggling. I remember one day I was out mowing the grass and it's, you know, it's 190 degrees, you know, in Georgia and I'm melting and mowing in the lawn, you know, everyone's like, Oh, you get a great big lawn when you move to Georgia. And I'm like, I don't need to own the park. I just need access to one. I mean, this is ridiculous. So I remember being out there and as I'm mowing, I had this thought, did I really want to move here? Or did Nancy just make me think that I wanted to move here? And then I thought, and I'm not proud of this in the least, but hopefully this might free somebody up. I thought to myself, you know what? I think she always gets what she wants. I think she always just makes me think that I, I made that decision. And then I had this thought, I think she's manipulative. And when you put that kind of label on your spouse, your brain does a thing called confirmation bias, which is basically you find what you're looking for. So if somebody says my spouse is lazy, their brain is always searching for pattern. So if they see, you know, they're going to see them laying on the couch, not, not the fact that they were working for nine hours. Or if they say they're my spouse is always complaining they're only going to notice the complaining words. And so when I labeled my wife as manipulative, something as simple as, hey, it's time for dinner could be turned into, oh, she's always manipulating me. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, that's, but no one, I never stopped to think it. And then I started seeing, you know, all this research on this. And then I started to run, if I were to run my wife through Philippians 4, 8, which is what I encourage people to do, you know, what's, what's true? You know, whatever's true. What's true is we both made the decision to move here. What was also true is she was adjusting better than me. What was also true is I was missing my friends. Whatever's true, whatever's noble. Well, I'll tell you what's noble. What was really noble was that my wife left everyone she knew to, to join my life in California for five years. 
So she had been out there with me for five years. I'm back in Georgia for three or four months. And all of a sudden she's manipulative. Right. And so it was one of those things. And I just want to encourage people, you know, as a takeaway, you know, the thought that I want to encourage them is see the best, just three words in this moment, I'm going to see the best. I'm going to look at them. Like we want them to look at us. Like we think they even should be looking at us hmm. to see the best. And when we do that, it just changes things that when we start to see the best, you know, and the great thing is this verse starting with true. This isn't about living a lie. This isn't about you stopping communication. This isn't about acting like something's not there. This is certainly not about somebody putting themselves in harm way, because if somebody's being abused or it's, then the truth of that is that that can't be that has to stop immediately or something something radical needs to happen and so the truth is a great protector but then you get to move in also what's true about them what's noble what's right and that verse ends with if anything is excellent or pray for it think praise on these things. anything just think on these things so just that one thought is what happy couples are already doing, right? They're already seeing the best in their spouse. Yeah, and you have a, a pretty powerful sentence in here. It says, how you think about your spouse will determine how you treat your spouse. I mean, that's as succinct as it gets to be able to lay that out. And if we're going back to the overarching idea from the book, which is to, a change of thoughts can lead to a change in your marriage, boy, that's a pretty good place to start. I am... Um, I'm thankful. We have friends who I don't hear. Um, I don't hear my friends speak negatively about their spouses, but I mm. have been around some who have uh, people who have this. They don't use the phrase "my old lady" anymore, but they use. You know, it used to be a thing. Now it's now it's not quite as as common to hear that. Um, I, I felt sorry for for those folks who are in what seems to be an adversarial mindset, even if it's just their talk around the guys or the gals or whatever. It's, I, I've long believed, uh, Ted, that how you talk about your spouse in their absence says more about that, about your relationship than how you talk about them in their presence. Mm. You know, I, I would hate to have the, the, the fear or the concern or the anxiety that when my wife and I are with different groups of people that I have to worry about what she's telling them. Oh, I can't, I can't imagine. I know. And you see both, you see both sides of that and you're exactly right. You know, and we, people use the word venting a lot, like it relieves pressure. Yeah. And what the research shows is that when you go and you tell somebody those negative things in a negative light, in a non-productive way, it actually cranks down the pressure and makes it bigger. It doesn't relieve anything. It certainly doesn't release like, oh, I went and said all these things I'm frustrated with my spouse about. And I just, oh, now I feel better. Right. You just show back up like more charged up and convinced than ever, especially if you have a friend who is not courageous enough to say, whoa, 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 come on, dude. Like we got to have those people around us for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I, um, I'm also thinking about those couples that have a, a scarred background. You know, everybody mm -hmm. comes to their marriage with a unique storyline, some wonderfully healthy, loving, nurturing relationships that were based in a foundation of faith, and many that weren't, uh, many that were just a nightmare. And they grew up not not having ever witnessed a proper relationship demonstrated for them. And they come mm -hmm. into this when they want to get it right, but man, they're just, they don't have the tools in the toolbox because they've never really seen it modeled for them. And, uh, and one of your intentional thoughts, uh, in this concept of thinking differently is to remember who I am. Mm. Um, can you expound on that a little bit? Because I, I love the idea of reminding everybody that if you come from a scarred and tattered and messy background, it doesn't automatically mean that's what you have to be moving forward. Mm. Oh, that's so good. What, what has been so yeah, you know, so so surprising in this whole process of putting together this book is I do the the first chapter after the introduction is this question of what do you think about yourself, and it's a whole chapter on like what what's going on in your mind about your about yourself as as you're thinking, and I call this negative voice in my head. I call him Fred. I call him Fred in my head, and Fred, to use the kindest word that I could think of, is a jerk. And when your Fred says things to you, like, 
you know, when you, after you get out of a meeting going, well, you didn't do well then. Or I could tell Fred's a mind reader, by the way, Fred says, I could tell that, you know, that Sarah really thought your presentation was no good. Or, you know, you go by the mirror and Fred goes, look at you, man, you're looking rough or whatever, that there's this voice in our, in our head. I call him Fred. And I thought I was the only person with a Fred in my head. And there's actually an exercise in the book to help you get Fred out of your head. What I have found of all the book, one of the things that has resonated the most is this idea of Fred in your head, that we live as if Fred's telling us the truth. And the problem with Fred is for a lot of us, his voice becomes way louder than the voice of God, which I've got to know breaks the heart of God. And when I was writing this chapter, it kept coming back to, to Romans. And I kept hearing the spirit I gave you is not... Uh, one of that of a slave so that you live in fear again. And I remember that that verse kept coming up over and over. And I, I literally remember thinking, God, this doesn't have anything to do with our thoughts. And then I go look up the definition of the spirit I gave you. That spirit is, is defined, is translated into dominant frame of mind. The dominant frame of mind I gave you is that not one of fear so that you live it like a slave again. Rather, the spirit I gave you uh, it comes through adoption into sonship and by him we cry, Abba. And that's where, remember who you are. We forget that we are, are God's child. We forget that our Abba father loves us. And those of us who are parents can remember those, you know, remember those moments or see those moments, have those moments go, I can't believe I love this little person like I do. And we're human. And you can imagine that father looking at us and just how much he loves, loves us. I got to know it breaks his heart that that we're listening to some voice that's just not telling us the truth. Wow. And so I get really excited and pumped up about helping people get Fred out of their head. And there's, you know, there's been an exercise around for 30 years that's really helpful to do that, but no one's told us about it. It's really, really simple. Um, and I just did my model of it in the in the book. And instead of talking at the end of it, you talk back to your thoughts. I I thought, what would your Abba say to you? I'd rather have scripture talk back to me than me talk back to me. But just to really like, it, it's really simple exercise. You name your Fred, you write down your thoughts, you categorize, I call him his side hustles. He's a mind reader. He's a shamer. He's a blamer. He's a fortune teller. You categorize them. And then you say, what would my Abba say to me? And it just from a neurological perspective, really calms things down and really gets you in a better place. And I think as a believer, I think it honors the heart of God that, that we were, that we are remembering that he loved us so much that Christ died for us. And if you've been a believer more than, you know, a couple of years, that can start to fade into the background, just that type of radical love. And so I just start to think of what do you think about yourself? Because for instance, if you're if you're riding home from work and you start having those negative thoughts about your job or something going on with the kids, and then you walk in and you greet your spouse, what kind of spouse are they hmm. walking into? Right. Are you anxious? Are you nervous? Are you ready to ready to listen, ready to love? Probably not. So that's why this fret in your head is such a big deal for people to remember who who and whose they are, most importantly. Well, that's so good. I think of some of this in the context of of sports and in my world, I, I do some stuff in the world of golf and it cracks me up every time I see a horrendous golfer giving advice to his buddies and they're on the range <laughs> and you you could just stand nearby on the range. You'll see a guy who can't get a ball in the air. He's hitting one grounder after another, but then he sees his, his friend next to him. He's like, you know what you're doing wrong. And he starts telling him all these things. And I'm like, dude, you don't have the slightest idea what you're doing. How could, you know, and, and why anybody would listen to, we'll just call him Fred, Fred in the fairway, but Fred's in the right. rough. Uh, I don't know why anybody would listen to him. And I also, mm. I, I, you know, if I take that over into the world of relationships, um, we are, we are inundated. We are flooded by a culture that really has, has not gotten much right at all. And yet it seems like many of us, are willing to take advice from a failed culture for mm -hmm. some reason. I don't even know what it is, right? So um, as we talk about changing our thoughts, do we also need to change um, the permission slip for who gets to speak into our lives? That's so good. That is that is so good. And, you know, and 
I've never thought about this before, but you, you bring that up. And I think, you know, if somebody does say something to us, we say, does this sound like Fred? Does this sound like the father? Right. Mm-hmm. Like who, who is this guy? Is he agreeing with Fred or is he agreeing with the father? Does this, and to really take that in, it's really, it really has helped me. Like I found that when I listen to Fred, I tend to start trying to gauge what everybody else is thinking. And I'm trying to guess what they're thinking. Cause that's Fred's game. He's constantly, he just creates fear all the time of what happened there. And what, you know, as a speaker, you know, I get done speaking and Fred's w- waiting in the rental car. I mean, in right. fact, he's waiting outside the thing, you know, you're walking out and it's, Oh, I can't believe you said this. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you did this. And then on the plane all the way home. And then, you know, I just never thought to question him until I started researching for this book. And I thought, oh, wow, like this, would, this had really mattered to me way more than I ever dreamed. Man, this goes a lot of different directions. I can see how um, your fingers on the keyboard must have just been flying because as this stuff comes to you, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So we're we're connecting our thoughts to those who are giving us advice to the things that we've experienced growing up to the reality and the truth of scripture. And then I, I think about this and I realize that in our audience, we'll have people who come to this from a foundation of faith, and then we'll have people who don't. I don't know how you tackle some of these things from a background that doesn't include faith in an unshakable, unmovable a uh, set of truths, which is found in scripture, because our culture keeps shifting and shaking. You know, the things that were acceptable 15 years ago, you're now canceled for even thinking. I mean, it's just, it's nuts how everything has moved around. And yet what hasn't moved around are the truths in scripture that have given us this blueprint for healthy relationships. Um, I, I think as we kind of wind down our time together, Ted, if you want to take a moment and just kind of talk about how you can find a foundation on which to build those changed thoughts, right? So that those changed thoughts aren't continually anchored to the latest news from the Kardashian world, but they're anchored instead to something that's not going to keep shifting and shaking and having cosmetic surgery. Right. One of the things that I love about what I've gotten to do over the years is there's no conflict with science and scripture when it comes to marriage. I can't speak for any other category, but I can speak with passion about that. When you start seeing what the marriage research reveals and what scripture, scripture is way more uh, practical in terms of application. Pra- you know, all the research will tell us what's going on in the situation. But I think what scripture always does is, and here's what you do about that. So long before I got geeked out on neuroscience, there was a way to do this. And so all the five thoughts are based on five pieces of, of scripture. Like I go, you know, I know if n- nothing else, if people can get these five thoughts that are based on five passages, that's never going to change. Like, I don't think that I'm going to look back on this book, you know, in 20 years from now and say, Oh, I should have done different thoughts. Maybe we can add to them and maybe I should, I could have phrased them differently. I don't know. But at the same time, I know what they're based off of. You know, for instance, one of them is just pause. You know, because when you're triggered by your spouse, it's the same part of your brain that's triggered when you drop your hand on a hot stove and your logical part of your brain goes out to lunch. And then you say those things you don't want to say. Some of us do. Some of us, you know, it's fight fight or fleet, uh, freeze, right? And so James 1, 19 and 20, be quick to listen, be slow to speak and slow to com- become angry. And you think, that speaks perfectly that when you're triggered, just pause, just don't talk. People talk, marriage is so complicated. No, the next time you're triggered, just take a breath and just pause and allow the logical part of your brain to come back online. It said it takes eight seconds for the logical part of your brain to come back online once you're triggered. So just, and I, somebody comes up to me after I taught on this last weekend and they said, I wonder if it takes eight seconds to read James 1, 19 and 20. And I thought, Oh, that's really good. So what I want, you know, what I don't want people to do right now is feel overwhelmed by what we're talking about it and the deep layers and how it goes. It's just to take a breath and go, okay, what if I just had five quick thoughts to guide me, how I think about myself, how I think about my spouse, how I think about their emotions, 
how I think about rhyme and response, and how I think about the purpose of marriage. And if I can have these five really quick, quick thoughts, I don't need to be overwhelmed. I don't need to uh, alter everything in my life. I don't have to change all those things. It's just in those really practical moments or in those times. And I think that's been great. It's the simplicity of it. It's somebody going, okay, because my goal every time that I'm done speaking or when someone reads something, I always imagine the person going, that was fun and I can do that. Like I'll have mm -hmm. men say to me, no, I can do that as opposed to whatever they've experienced in the past. I go, okay, that's great. I can do that. And that's what I hope people get to go, oh, okay, okay, I, I can do that. That's been the goal of the whole book. And so it's been, you know, I even tell people to go, hey, just pick one of the five. I mean, you don't have to tackle all five at once. Just pick one of the five. So it may just be pausing. You just may need to learn to cool your jets and just pause. Yeah. So, so you know, I get good. excited about that. Well, I can I can understand why because it is mm -hmm. difference making. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you looking for for more information about Ted and maybe to have him come speak at your event, your conference, marriedpeople.org is the website. And the book that we've been talking about is called Us in Mind. How Changing Your Thoughts Can Change Your Marriage. It is out now everywhere books are found. We'll put a link to it in the podcast notes as well. And uh, Ted, one of these days, we'll, we should probably get on a rhythm that's a little more regular than once every two and a half years. So we'll we'll try to do that. You just, that just means you have to crank out books more frequently. So I, I'm going to say no. I'm yes, going to say I, I, this, this has got to be it. This is, please <laughs> let this be it. Yeah, that's this it. is it. <laughs> this is it. Thanks, Ted. Thank you.